non rock a boatus must stop. I don't want to rock the boat. I want to sink it. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy? Or are you going to bite? Brett, delusional. The, the, yeah, I love you, Jeff. Delusional. Yeah. Delusional is okay in your worldview. I'm an animal. You don't chastise chickens for being delusional. You don't chastise pigs for being delusional. So you calling me delusional using your worldview is perfectly okay. It doesn't really hurt. <laughs> she hung up on me. Yes! Oh! Oh my God. What? What? Desperate times call for faithful men and not for careful men. The careful men come later and write the biographies of the faithful men, lauding them for their courage. Go into all the world and make disciples. Not go into the world and make buddies. Not to make brosives. Right. Don't go into the world and make homies. Right. Disciples. Well, I, yeah. got, I got a bit of a jiggle neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, Pastor. When we have the real message of truth, we cannot let somebody say they're speaking truth when yeah. they're not. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Apologia Radio. You guys can get us at ApologiaStudios.com. That's A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A Studios.com. Go there to get all the past episodes, over 300 some odd past episodes, podcast radio shows, some great theologians, scholars, scientists, a lot of cultural engagement, debate, a lot of stuff we hope will bless you and your walk with the Lord Jesus and your witness to the world. You can also go to ApologiaStudios.com to sign up for All Access. When you sign up for All Access, you make everything that we do possible. You partner with us in ministry, and you also get access to all of the additional content. You get access to Apology Academy. You get access to the After Show. You get access to Apology at TV. Everything that is there, we um, put that up there for all of our ministry partners who make everything we do possible. I encourage you to check out the last couple of days of content. We have some great stuff up there. Uh, evangelism conversation with a young lady outside of uh, one of the mills we were ministering at. We have some new content coming up with uh, stories with uh, John Barros. Of all so the, excited. So excited about, about that. So it's, excited. It sounds like Jerry right now. So excited. So excited about this episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, just lots of great stuff there. Lots of great stuff happening. God's blessing. So many ways. Thank you to all of our ministry partners who have made everything possible for us to be a witness to the world. God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of Apologia Radio. Very excited about this episode. You... I think are going to learn a lot, be encouraged. We have lots of stuff to show you, to talk about in light of all the cultural um, circumstances that we are facing right now. Wanted to point, of course, to an amazing passage from the Word of God. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Messiah, Jesus, Galatians 3, 28. I think most of you guys know that passage. I hope you do. It's an amazing one. And it's, uh, it's really at the center and the heart of the gospel itself and the Christian world being what the Lord Jesus, the King of the earth, the Messiah is doing in the world, bringing all the tribes, tongues, peoples, nations, languages together into one body under the same only God and uh, to love and worship him together. So I am here today with uh, Luke the Bear. What up? I'm Jeff the Calmer the Ninja. Of course, you can see to my left over here, we have a special guest today. This is Zach Lautenschlager, our boy. Howdy. How you doing, brother? I'm well, thank you. All, all right, so glad you could join us today, brother. Let's see, lots to go through. And you have to forgive me, guys. We had so much going on today. I totally forgot to plug in the video stuff here. I hope this doesn't blow things up. And uh, so, Isaac, you just get ready and just tell me if it works or not. <laughs> Let's see if this uh, works. While you're doing that, I got a funny story. Go for tell it. about our friend here. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> Mr. Zach. Which, by the way, I put the shirt on today. This is I J.C. Ryle. And I realize I this looks that. like an old version of you. It does. <laughs> Doesn't it? It totally does. Like if your beard was like a foot longer. Right, right. Yeah. Um, Is it a future version? Yeah, future. We we were uh, coming today. With, I was with my wife, and we pulled up behind this van at the stoplight. And my daughter was like, Utah, I get a point or something. I don't know what she was playing in the back. And, and my wife goes, oh, big van, Utah, must be Mormons. <laughs> and then we pulled up right behind Zach and his wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have six children. Yeah, but I also have a beard. So yeah, then you know the the, uh, the main Mormons don't have beards yeah. anymore. If I shave, they think I'm one of them. Oh, I know. We we have a few families at our church with big vans like that that get mistaken all the time. 
with lots of kids. So uh, is it working? Are we good? So Luke, uh, blow uh, Isaac, t- Isaac told me to check the power strip. Um, so did it get uh, turned off again? I don't okay. know. Maybe it did. Hold on. Let's let's give it a I'm shot. I'm going to disappear for you, a second. Yeah, you work on that right uh, there. That might have been me. I plugged in down there next to the switch. Yeah. I so tried Luke, not to. Bump sorry, it by. sorry. I apologize. All the technical issues are now it's working right. live. How, what's that? It's, it's on. In. It's plugged in. Yeah. All right. So uh, I don't know what's going on here, Isaac. We'll uh, we'll see if I can get this to work. We only do things very professionally here at Apologia Studios, as you can see. Um, <clears throat> well, I just I wanted to be able to show you this, uh, at least this picture here. Well, m- maybe I don't have to do it. Uh, we could probably skip some of this stuff if it's just not going to work. Um, well, let's let's talk. Obviously, obviously, we are facing a lot of stuff right now in our current culture and in our circumstances. We're talking about the riots, the, the looting that's going on all over the country. We're talking about uh, the class conflict and uh, all of the difficulties that we have to really be able to provide an answer for as Christians. And we really do, do need to, as Christians be able to provide an answer for what's happening around us because if we don't step into this moment and provide biblical answers that are consistent with the biblical worldview, that are consistent with God's law, then someone else is going is, is to find that space and they're going to step in there and they're going to give something that actually isn't Christian, isn't true, isn't biblical. And many people are doing that right now, even with the veneer of the Christian world, you're using Christian language and all the rest, and it can devastate, really, our current circumstances. It can devastate the lives of our children and our grandchildren if Christians don't do the really hard task of, of facing the culture and pointing to the cultural idols, uh, calling people to repent of them, pointing to the God's just and righteous statutes, and uh, calling people to actually uphold those. And the reason why I'm t- talking about this is um, <clears throat> you'll hear people today in the midst of this conflict, uh, popular you know buzz term going around today, social justice. And you'll even hear people come on in, Carmen. I, I'll, I'll talk to I'll talk to everyone while you're trying to figure this situation out. This is Carmen, guys. Say hi to Carmen. Hi. Yeah, he's he's, hi, he's Carmen. Is, is this your first time in the middle of an episode? I think so. It is. This is this is Car- Carmen's been with us for for <laughs> for forever. For how long? You were just a baby when you first came to us. Like five years. Like it, maybe five six years something like that. As we, you can see from his face, there's a reason we hide him. Yeah, <laughs> that's messed up. <laughs> so Carmen. Uh, actually, a lot of the old content you'll see from Apologia Studios was Carmen, a little little Carmen, little boy Carmen, hide my camera. We little just, Carmen, just we little Carmen, working, working, working the camera stuff. Um, so back to the discussion, the issue of social justice. Um, people are using that terminology today. They're using it a lot, and I said that people are using even a Christian veneer. They're they're talking a lot about you know Christian language as they talk about social justice. But if you challenge these people and you ask them, um, uh, what do you mean by that? Like, okay, so we've got this systemic racism, we've, we've got privilege, we've got all these problems in culture and society, um, and so what we need is social justice. So, okay, great, I'm all ears. What is social justice according to your perspective? And what you don't hear coming from these people who are professing to be believers and they're, they're using this Christian language, you don't hear things that are consistent with God's stipulated uh, statutes and law, like what he's revealed, like this is justice, these are righteous statutes, and all the rest, you really hear things that are just coordinate with the neo-Marxist perspective, intersectionality. You, you really hear them talking like communists. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's wicked, it's evil, it isn't Christian, no matter how many, uh, no, matter, no matter the robes you're wearing while you say it, no matter the little white thing at your neck as you say it, no matter what's going on, you say social justice, you call yourself a Christian, if you're not talking about what's in God's law, it isn't justice, it isn't social justice. Uh, and so we need to talk about that. What's it mean? If it, Look, if we're going to engage in the conversation about systematic racism, we're going to talk about um, privilege, and we're going to talk about all these even the murder of George Floyd, we have to do it in a way that's coherent, that's meaningful, that's biblical, that's Christian, fundamentally Christian. If you're new to Apologia Radio, and nice to meet you, I'm Jeff, that's Luke, um, 
and we've been doing this for a long time, we're pastors of Apology at Church, we want you to know our standard. Our standard is the revealed Word, word of God. If you yep. want to take a very high, you know, philosophical terminology and know where we're coming from, if, you, if you're into that kind of thing, we have a, refor- a, a, a revelational epistemology. That means that we know what we know, and we can claim to know things and be certain about them, because God himself has revealed himself to us, and he's told us so. He's told us, this is who I am, this is my world, this is who you are, this is the gospel, this is the truth, this is righteousness, uh, this is what holiness is. And so our perspective is certainty is found in the word of God. Certainty doesn't go with the different waves of, of cultural um, uh, likes and dislikes and all the different propaganda that we're seeing today. We're asking the question of, what does God say? What's his word say? What's, what's the truth? Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We believe that the living God, the one who is the first, the last, the beginning and the end, the only God who knows of no other gods, the one and only true and living God is the standard of truth. You want to know what's true? You go to God's word. You want to know what's just in society? You go to God's law. You want to know what God says about human beings and races? Uh, there's a human race, and then there are tribes. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, what we're seeing today around us is uh, really uh, tribalism. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about it today. We, wanna, we have big help today, and we bring glory to Jesus. We have a lot to do. I'm trying to go fast here, and one of the things Luke says, like, we've got a lot to go over today, so we've got to go fast. So yep. I'm going to try to do that. So, uh, Isaac, how are we doing? Uh, we have audio, but no video. Uh, we, have, we have audio or, or no vid- video, for vi- some reason. video, but no audio. Carm, or Isaac, just come on in here and let me know. I want to make sure everyone sees this stuff. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, audio, but no video. Okay, well, let me try again. That's, it's probably your fault, Isaac. No, no, so <laughs> it probably is. You, you have to switch the resolution on the Mac. Carmen came and did that. He tried to, but it didn't show the proper resolution we needed. For some reason, it's just not there. Okay. All right. Well, maybe we'll just it? maybe we'll That's just a mystery. Maybe we'll just skip it. I had some fun stuff to show everybody, but we'll just we'll just go through the issues. All right. But hey, Jeff, how good are you working with a Mac? Um. Well, the C Macs are stupid. No. And, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask why are you using a Mac, but now yeah, I guess yeah. No, well, it's, no, it's not his. It's I'll, I'll just leave it. The there. guys I'll on the other end. It's it. the guys over there. Yeah. I mean, it's their fault. And yeah. let's just call that's it. That's why let's it's just not working. It's <laughs> well, we, I'm glad you guys are hanging with us through these technical issues. Uh, we do have a lot to go over. I'm just going to go ahead and go over the stuff. I just wanted you to see. I'll just send you, I'll just send you to our page when we get um, to it. For those listening on the live stream, yes, there's a video of us. <laughs> there's not a video of what Jeff's trying to play. Yeah. People are like, no, there's a video of you. No, I, I think, yeah, thank you guys. I know you guys can see us right now, but we're trying to get you to see what's on my computer. I had some fun stuff I wanted to show you. Actually, I had some really fun stuff that's, uh, uh, it, it means a lot to me, actually. It's, uh, I was going to show you a, a video of my, my coach and then one of my teammates. And, ah, uh, oh, it stinks, man. I, you, know, you know what we could do? Maybe I'll save that stuff for after we take a commercial break and oh, we can yeah. have the guys come in here to fix yeah. it during the if commercial break. If we go break. to commercial break, we'll get it going. Okay, that's what we'll you do. Better. Uh, yeah, I'll, so I'll, I mean, sa- I'll save that. If you want to do it sooner, that's fine. I'll do it. I'll do it later after commercial break. This way we don't fiddle around with it on the show. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. I'm sorry about all the technical issues right now. All right, here we go. Let's talk... Um, <clears throat> So uh, let's let's start with the thing that's in the f- the front part here of the uh, the title of of this particular broadcast, this show, and that's the issue of uh, systemic racism. Uh, systemic racism. Let's talk about it because it's important. It's something that's kicked around a lot right now. First, let's lay some, a foundation down so that everybody who hears this understands something about what we believe. What we believe is true. What we believe is beautiful, and what's what's most important in this discussion, we hold to a Christian worldview, and that means that we believe in a Creator, and we believe in a creation, and we are creatures made by the only God. Uh, everything you see around us was made by this God. There is only one God, and we are unique creations of this one God. God created in the garden his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so we believe that human beings, all human beings, are made in the imago dei, in the image of God. We absolutely reject and repudiate the perspective of Charles Darwin and Darwinianism, that teaches that there are certain groups of people based upon the color of their skin that are less evolved. Uh, If you hate, look, look, if you all use the words, it's popular. If you hate racism today, then you need to go and talk to your public schools 
Because the worldview taught in the public school system for a long time now is the neo-Darwinian, micromutation, macroevolutionary worldview, speciation, one thing going to another. You have, you know, all of us descendants of bacteria, and we have evolved here through unguided processes, and, you know, there's no purpose or meaning or goal-directed forces in the universe. There is no good. There is no evil. You know, your sexuality is your sexuality. Mine is mine. And you've got human beings as part of just this sort of... Uh, the story of the universe that doesn't have a storyteller, right? It's just happening. It's just time and chance acting on matter. And you've got the Darwinian model, the evolutionary worldview. And look, just look, grab hold of it, accept it. It's what it teaches. That's where it came from, right? You've got people who have evolved in this purposeless universe and cosmos who are less evolved, okay? You don't believe me? Go look up Darwin on his view of black people. And uh, so if you don't like the issue of racism and sort of like this, this idea of purposeless and human beings as tribes better than the other, less evolved, look, that's, that's been tried before. You, you know, you heard it before. You've, you know the story. You've heard, you know, uh, I know it looks like a person. It's not a person. It's a mm-hmm. Jew, right? Mm-hmm. I know it looks like a person. It's not a person. It's a black slave. Like people have done that. And that comes from somewhere. And let me tell you where it doesn't come from. from, Come from Christianity. It doesn't come from God's word. Because God's word says, uh, from one blood, God has made all these different tribes and nations and people. So, look, Mm -hmm. here's the deal. All these different colors, all the differences in cultures, they are stinking awesome. All right? Like, black is beautiful. White is beautiful. Brown is beautiful. Like, I love what uh, Vodi says uh, when he talks about, like, one of the things you get away from as a Christian is, like, looking at me and saying you don't see black. Like, he's like, don't, don't do that. Yes, we're all in the image of God. Like, we're mm. all exactly the same. He's like, but God gave me this because it's, cause it's beautiful. Because, mm-hmm. like, he wanted it, and he gave you the way he gave you because yeah. it's beautiful. He says it's like looking at a rose garden with all these different color roses mm. and saying all I see is rose. So it's, true. Right. It's like, no, it's awesome. Like, yeah. that's the creator. It's beautiful, yeah. right? And so all these differences are amazing. Amazing, but the truth is, is that all of us have the same mom and dad. Ultimately, we're brothers and sisters in humanity. So the Christian worldview says this. There's no difference ontologically. Like, we are the same Mm -hmm. human beings, human family. And so all of us as image bearers of God have unique value and worth and dignity and beauty, all that stuff, right? And all of us deserve justice, Right? God wants justice for all humans, no matter the color. So if you want to know where we're coming from in terms of race, tribes, all that stuff, we're all the same before God, and we need the same Savior. And the beauty of the gospel of the kingdom is the one God and his one Savior of the world, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, all of that brings together all the tribes to peace and unity and harmony and love before his throne. That's the beautiful worldview that this world needs right now. You're not solving this problem through money, throwing money at the issue of racism. You're not going to solve this problem through government control. You're not going to solve this problem through pithy platitudes. You're going to solve this problem when human hearts are transformed and they see God for who he is and them for who they are, mm. and they come together under the throne of the one God because of Jesus. The Christian worldview is the solution to this problem. It is. Yeah. It's, only, it's the only solution that matters, is meaningful, and is true. All that to say, into the discussion, people say we've got to deal with systemic racism. It's systemic racism. Okay, you already know how we feel about tribalism and the sin of the hate of another person because of the color of their skin, all the rest. But we got to think like Christians. we got to think like Christians and say, think logically, reasonably. So let's deal with the issue of systemic racism. People bring it up a lot right now. So my response, look, I'm a pastor, I'm a minister of the gospel. It's my job to listen. It's my job to be corrected where I need to be corrected. And it's my job to speak the truth where it needs to be spoken no matter how much it hurts somebody or rubs against cultural um, sensitivities, all that stuff. Here, here's the thing. Someone says to me, look, there's systemic racism. I'm going to say, okay, all right, that's, that sounds serious. And uh, if it's true, uh, racism is a sin, deserves to go to hell. So let's deal with it. Where? And so it's systemic racism. It's, it's everywhere. I'd say, oh, that's interesting. Um, I've been here for a long time. I'm 42 years old. And um, I know, stop it. 
42 years old, and um, I'm having a hard time seeing the systemic racism. In t- not saying I don't see racism. I do. Mm-hmm. There are racists, and it deserves to go to hell. That's not a good sa- distinction. Sa- can you make the distinction? Yeah. Systemic racism versus hatred and evil of another person. Racism. There are racists out there, and it's an abomination, and it will burn in hell forever. Okay, so there you go. Now I feel about it. But systemic means systematic system. It's built into the system. So I go, all right. Now, I know that, you know, in the 50s, 100%, yes. I mean, I can point to the laws. You can see it historically. You go, systemic? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have laws and ordinances that prohibit certain people, certain uh, people of color not to do certain things or not to have certain privileges or rights or justice or whatever the case may be. I go, yeah. I I mean, I'll take you to the 50s, and I'll show you the ordinances and the laws. I'll show you the video. Like, that's evil, wicked. I mean, to hell with that. Mm. But... I see today and I go, systemic, uh, can you show me the law or ordinance that prohibits a white person from doing a particular thing because they're white? Or let's talk about what we need to talk about. Do you, do you know of a law or ordinance that says um, that a black a person of color, a black person because of the color of skin can't get a job or should be put a certain place in the line? It's an ordinance, it's a law, it's in the system. Or do you know of a particular ordinance that prohibits a black person from holding a certain office or what? Systemic means it's in the system. There's an ordinance, there's a law. And so my challenge is that, can you show me the, the, the law or ordinance that prohibits based upon color? Now, if somebody says, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, no, 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 there isn't that. There's just obvious racism happening i go that's a different thing racism in somebody's heart expressed over here is a sinful expression it should be repudiated we should all call it out we should hate it and heap scorn upon it but when you say systemic it's in the system so where's the law where's the ordinance and if you can't point to it then it isn't systemic it's an expression over here that's large scale broad bird's eye view looking above right But Zach does have something to say (laughs) in terms of systemic racism that is happening today. Sure. And so let's talk about that. Hold on. Before you get to that, because I I don't want to miss this point, I would say, if anything, the systemic racism (laughs) points the other direction. And what I mean by that, especially in in pro sports, for for example, there's a lot like in football and some of these other groups, like you... There's law. There are rules. They're not laws, but they're rules. Where if you're hiring a new coach or like someone in management, you have to interview someone that's a minority. Mm. Right. Like, so in other words, affirmative action. Exactly. And yeah. that someone just said that it's you know it's not systemic racism. It's affirmative action. But that's the point. Is like no, that's you know, and like I know even within the church, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of years. There's there's pastors coming out that are saying, um, if if I had the choice between um, a white pastor who's more qualified and a black pastor who's less qualified i would go with the black pastor because i need more color in my church mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that's and that's but that's the direction it's going so i think it's pointing the other way i don't think it's pointing the direction that everybody's saying. yeah and, and even in those cases though here's yeah. what's important in order to demonstrate something is systemic you've got to be able to point to the systematic exactly. ac- a- application exactly. that's inherent in the system that right. everybody's following right not just a particular expression from a person exactly or a particular community but systemic is every and that's what's being argued is it systemic yeah it's law like it's ordinance it's built into the system mm-hmm. and the answer is you probably need to get out more of your community because if you find racism large scale in your community you should probably come to mind for a little bit right over here in mine because in my community it isn't what you're seeing over there so a lot of this has to do with pockets Mm -hmm. and i and i want to point i'm gonna let the hand hand this off to zach here because this is really important to hear what he has to say but can i just say this please please hear me on this and just please be gracious to me on this and just just trying to give me a hearing be humble enough to give me a hearing Uh, i'm going to talk in a minute about my almost being killed because of the color of my skin uh and uh, that was a particular community that I was around at the time. Um, but I want, I want to point to the fact that this is a, a, an expression of the sinful heart of man that exists all over the planet. So can I give you one example? If you're in Japan right now, or certain parts of China, yeah. do you know that China. It's, it's, it's not color difference? It's, right. it's I hate you because you're Chinese. Yeah. I hate you because you're Japanese. But guess what? You're both Asian. So there's this, there's this hatred of the other person yeah. because of their culture, and it's Japanese versus Chinese. And then if you can move to other parts of the world, guess what? Ireland. And Ireland. 
it's another example of white on white but it's cultural and it's and they say it's protestant versus catholic but guess what that's meaningless it's not even really doctrinal it's just cultural community exactly. animosity and guess what the problem is whites on whites like what do we do with that it's all over the world this is hate in the heart of man exactly. of another image bearer yes. of god sometimes it's expressed yeah. because of color sometimes no right and they you know when you look at it it that's as that's as racist as white on black black on white we, we are one race mm. uh, Bodhi is correct mm-hmm. um and it does have a, a you know a, a heritage aspect if you look at the white on white in ireland mm-hmm. i i come from the ulster scots so you know that's uh, some that's my people i was just in your <laughs> home that's that reality <laughs> yes, yeah exactly yeah. so I, I think that you know when we look at that bigger picture and we ask is it is it systematic racism no but it is systematic oppression mm-hmm. is it systematic oppression of one race no the federal government has been oppressing people for a really long time. Mm. Um, I grew up in South Dakota where we have a very, very small black population, but our minority are Native American. Mm. And every day, and I'll talk with my Native American friends who were legitimately oppressed and hurt and and violated by a federal government. And I tell them, look, I'm really sorry. That is my government. Um, You're an American too, right? I mean, you're proud of that. It is your government too. And they oppress me as much as they oppress you. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting getting it too. That's right. (laughs) Right. We can look at a million different ways in which the federal government does this. What mm. about state governments? What about city government? This is evil, satanic philosophy applied to government. That's what it is. And one of the ways in which it does apply, and, and you know, I'm going to adjust my, my point from earlier, I think, because you know, it, if you're going to define systematic racism the way you just defined it, mm-hmm. and I said, well, yes, but there is gun control. Mm-hmm. It, is it supposed to be applied across the board? Yes, and unfortunately... It exists, and now we have wicked, evil government, which is applying it across the board. Now, the sad reality is you go to certain places, and you see them applying it very specifically to black people and not yeah, white people. Yeah, that pocket. And right. the reason it kind of doesn't fit in the, in the category is because gun control was passed for the express purpose of controlling black people. That's where it was invented in America. It didn't exist in America hmm. until we started saying, wait a minute. Now they're wow. reconstructing the South, but these people can vote. These people, those people, black people, we can't let them have guns. We need laws that say you can't have guns. And then it was, at that time, very selectively enforced. You could be a black dude and you couldn't own a gun. And a white man, you could have whatever you wanted. Mm. Gun control. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Straight mm. up gun control, um, but only for one side, right? Um, it's still applied yeah. that way. Now it's applied to everyone. But that is an example. And that's why I say systematic racism no systematic oppression you bet Mm -hmm. that is the evil of allowing our government to do things that are outside the jurisdiction that god has given them Mm -hmm. allowing to speak Mm -hmm. to anything that's outside just jurisdiction allowing them to do anything within that jurisdiction that god says is wrong Mm -hmm. or that we can principally say no that's the wrong step and the systematic oppression that you're referring referring to zach is systematic oppression from a government moving outside of their jurisdiction yep. upon everybody upon exactly. everybody although like you said you know maybe you need maybe you're in your neighborhood it is applied systematically to one color skin and not another right that does happen yeah that absolutely does happen um and there are certain uh, there are certain cultural realities not in every police department but there are some in some i've seen it i've you go to rapid city south dakota where i spent a lot of time growing up if you're an Indian guy, you're going to get treated really differently from by the police department there mm-hmm. than if you're a white guy, mm-hmm. and the laws are going to be applied differently to you. It does happen, mm-hmm. and I and, and so I agree 100% with what mm-hmm. you're saying. If we're going to say is there's systematic racism, what we're saying is that in America the laws are consistently applied differently to black people. Mm-hmm. No, that's not even true, and 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 it, that's very hard to argue. Yeah, it's very hard. That's my point. Very, it's very hard, hard, hard to argue, to argue that. that point. Yes. Yeah, you have to look at it and take it by case by case uh, basis in in terms of community. But what's the answer? The answer isn't the color issue. The answer is the justice issue. Put government back in its box. That's right. It's an issue of justice. What rights do? What what right. what should the government be doing? How are they supposed to operate? And how should they be treating every human being? Yes. So that the I want a just and righteous standard for George Floyd mm-hmm. and Jeff yes. Durbin. Mm-hmm. I want the same exact thing. And the, and the interesting thing here is that when you bring a, bring a good point. Uh, I, guys, I mean, we could spend a whole episode talking about the times in my life doing ministry as a pastor where we've been oppressed by the police. Yeah. We're Christians. 
Yeah. You know, there's, I mean, there, there, we have different color people at our church. We have a whole variety of colors at our church. But, you know, a lot of times it's the white Christians outside of abortion mills that are being abused by police officers. That's a common occurrence. There's no justice mm-hmm. for us, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not going to emphasize the issue of my color. I'm going to issue, I'm going to talk about the issue of justice. I'm, I'm, I'm at times not even, I'm not even going to bring up the issue. It's because I'm Christian. Ain't it? Right? I'm going to say, what you ought to be doing is upholding this constitutional standard. You don't have right. a right to search me, to seize anything. You don't even have a right to ask me questions right now. Like, I mean, just, uh, and I want that applied to everybody. Christian, black, white, red, yellow, purple. I don't care what you are. I want justice for everybody. And my interpretation of what just justice is, is the word of God. Like, these are his standards. This is what's right to do to every image bearer of God. So, I wanted, I wanted to talk about that issue of systemic racism, um, but then I want to talk about the issue, with, and it, I like how Zach sort of talked through that in terms of like, it, where are you? Like, it, it, in this place, yeah, it happens a lot. You'll see a lot of wickedness and evil and hatred for another person. Sometimes it's not black people. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's 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 quote unquote red people. Sometimes uh, you might be in some areas where and I and I I've witnessed this. You might be in some areas where it's a it's a largely uh, Hispanic community mm-hmm. and there are black people who are afraid to walk in those neighborhoods yeah. because there's a lot of hatred in terms of that color versus that color. Or if you're in LA you're Korean in certain neighborhoods and they're gonna come burn your business down. Mm. I mean that's it's hatred in the heart for yes. other fellow image bearers of God, and sometimes it just becomes tribal conflict. It's yeah. just tribalism. So what you want to yes. end is tribalism, and the person who brings the tribes together is Jesus. It makes us all together, unified, peace with God, peace among one another. Um, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted to bring this up in terms of, we have to think about this in terms of biblical categories and healing because of what God has done in Christ and who we really are according to God's definition. But you know, in my experience, and I, I wanted to say this as humbly as possible, you know that I think racism is an abomination. You know that I think that it's hatred for brother. You know that I've challenged anybody who names the name of Jesus who has hatred or animosity for another image bearer of God because of the color of their skin to repent in a hurry. Um, I, I do believe that people will be in hell for, quote, racism. Mm. It's a sin against a holy God. I think God hates racism. I think it's illogical. It's irrational. It is, it is wicked. Okay, you know how I feel about it. But can I tell you a personal history? Uh, and I know Luke probably has stories himself here. Uh, he grew up in Chicago mm-hmm. um, as, as a white guy in Chicago. Look, I grew up for a large part of my life in Washington, D.C. And um, I, I can tell you my very first day in school, I grew up on military bases um, all over in Holland and Japan. My very first public school uh, was Paul Monkey Middle School in uh, right outside Wa- Washington, D.C. Um, and... Um, what, My very fit, wait. What is it the called? name of the name of the city? Is is Pomunkey. Uh, it's Maryland. It's a, it's yeah. right. It's right. We were 15 minutes outside of Washington D.C. So I'm I'm I don't know a soul. I, I'm telling you the truth. Like I just drove from across the country. And we landed in Calif- like California or Vegas. We drove across the country. We get to D.C. And it's like, I don't know a soul. And it's my, like my, day of, my first day of school is like two days after I arrive in D.C. So everything's new to me. First public school experience, right? And uh, I don't know a soul. I walk into the, um, the, the gym uh, where everyone's gathering for like, you know, welcome to school kind of a thing. And I see a crowd of guys. They weren't my color, okay? Um, there, there were there were there were more black people in my school than there were white people. That was that was the that would be how it looked, right? And I see a group of guys sort of talking and obviously looking at me hard and everything. And next thing you know, one of the guys comes over and just starts wailing on me, like beating me up. But thank God I know martial arts, and so I threw him against the wall. We had a go at it, and uh, <laughs> people called me Kung Fu Jeff from that day forward. The very first day of school, it became actually very popular because it was like a Bruce Lee movie uh, right there, and uh, very successful, by the way. It was awesome. Um, now, watch. I'm going to continue the story here. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm white, okay? And um, my heroes in the, in the area um, 
many of them were black. So like mm-hmm. in the martial arts world is huge on the East Coast at the time. Um, I was competing every weekend. Um, I was traveling the nation. I was on national karate teams. I'm, I'm going to world championships, national championships. I mean, I'm, I'm at a new tournament every weekend. And at the time you had to go up and down the East Coast to go to the regional tournaments to get all your points to make sure you were still high in the rankings. Um, and so I went to a lot of tournaments regionally. I went to inner city very very scary places uh to do tournaments um all over i mean talking about new york new jersey washington dc some some hard areas right and can i just say something the the friends that i had the people that i looked up to most they weren't white they were my heroes they weren't white these are men that i highly revered and respected and then my coaches and my teammates weren't white these guys and these guys were legends i'm talking legends one of the greatest influences in my life was a man named Willie the Bam Johnson. He is a he is a powerful man. He is this little black guy, fast, strong, amazing. I used to when I, he used to go up to perform, I was in awe. Imagine me, this kid, like I'm in awe of this man. I'd follow him around tournaments, and I finally got to know him so well that I ended up sort of. Uh, I, it, he created a relationship with me. He became my coach, and he would train me once a week and teach me. He was my coach, and he was like the world champion. He was like the first American to win in China in, in, in a Wushu tournament. So he was legendary. He's in like movies and TV shows and all the rest. He was a legend in the sport, and now he's my teacher. And then we became very close, and then his son Marco essentially became like a brother to me. He stayed at my house. We lived together. I mean, like it was like family, right? And the guys on my team, these guys are my – these guys, I revered these men, different colors of skin than me i say all that to say this while this is happening and i'm living in washington dc you knew in washington dc that there were certain areas certain communities that if you came through and you had the wrong color skin your life was in danger your life was in danger one time because i was white i was walking through a neighborhood a car stopped people poured out of the car and pulled guns and pointed right at me started chasing me I was with a friend. We both split up, ran through the woods, ran into a neighborhood. I jumped over some random person's fence, crawled under the deck. I remember it to this day. There was like spider webs and mud and this random person's backyard under their wooden deck. And I'm just not moving while these men are yelling, you know, racial obscenities about my color of my skin. And they're chasing us with guns. Another time, it was like nine o'clock at night. I'm leaving my house to go spend the night with a friend. I'm walking through my own neighborhood around a curve. And I'm on, I'm on the left side of the road, so cars should be coming towards me on that side. I can hear an engine rumbling right behind me for like a good 30 seconds, 45 seconds. I'm like, why is this car on the wrong side of the street? But it's dark outside. I'm afraid to look behind me because I don't want to give off that I know there's someone behind me. And I'm coming to turn into the, where this cul-de-sac is. There's a house to my left. And guys, I'll never forget every breath of this moment. It was intense. I hear the car door opening behind me and I something inside me is like run. And so I start to run and I look behind me and out of this car spills a bunch of guys. And I it's nighttime, I'm alone, I'm like 15 years old. I turn the corner on the, this house and truth before God, this is what happened. Something deep in my soul it felt like just like i heard it inside me i know this sounds weird coming from a foreign guy i'm not charismatic i wasn't even a christian at the time all i heard was jump and i did i jumped there was bushes in front of this house i jumped over the bushes i landed on the ground i hit it like dead weight like just bricks bam and i didn't move because i didn't want to rustle the bushes so i hit that and next thing you know all i see under the bushes is boots 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 passing me right and all i hear the whole time is racial obscenities they're talking about me being white white m effer white this white that and these guys are now in the neighborhood so i wait for enough time to pass i peel myself back the other direction i go to the next cul-de-sac across the street i sneak across i'm hiding behind cars and i'm watching these men who are not my skin color looking under cars looking around this neighborhood for me and they're holding pipes i think and bats and it, it was all men not my color yelling racial obscenities in that community but here's what why you remember saying why are you bringing this up because that was an isolated place and those were guys who were expressing sin i wasn't even a christian you know what i never did you know what i never did i never then went to my training that was required for our national karate team with all of my black heroes and then assumed 
you have something to apologize for, right? Huh. Your community is guilty of this. I never went to my coach, Willie the Bam Johnson, who to this day is one of my greatest heroes, who's like a father to me. I never ever went into that training with him or had his son living with me like as a brother. I never s saw him any differently. I even saw then there are just particular pockets of this stuff that you just have to avoid. And I'll give you one more story. Luke's heard this probably a million times and then I'll shut up. One time I was going to film a video game. Uh, I was in a video game called The Untouchable. And I remember that the, the producer of the game was like, hey, we you know we're, we're filming it here in this location. And I was like, huh, I know the area really well. I'm from DC. I said, Travis, uh, that's not an area I'm supposed to be in. And he was like, no, 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 no. We rented this warehouse. We got it all set. The set's all there. It's all ready to go. We're only going to film during the daytime. You should be perfectly fine. I was like, Travis, that's n I don't feel good about this. Um, he's like, well, you know, you have to do it, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, but I have to be out of there before nighttime because it's, I, it's not safe for me. Everyone knows you can't go into that neighborhood if you're not that color. And so he's, he's like, don't worry, we'll have you out of there by nighttime. And sure enough, oh, by the way, the, this is the ice cream truck. The ice cream truck that came through that neighborhood was an armored vehicle. <laughs> And in, in like one of those bank vehicles, and when the ice cream came out, you'd put the money in, it would go ch ch chunk. <laughs> you'd put the thing in ch ch chunk, right? It was this, it was intense. Anyway, he didn't have us out of there. He didn't have us out of there until dark. And now I got to make my way through this neighborhood that everybody knows you can't drive through and not be that color. And I remember that night I'm driving, I had people in the car with me, and I'm literally, there's people on the corners like waiting for your car to stop. And I'm driving f past these red lights, and I'm driving literally right through them. I'm just driving through the red lights. I'm driving through the red lights. I'm not even stopping at the red lights because I know the rules <laughs> for this area, and I know that your life could be in danger. And I notice this car is pacing me the entire time, kind of you know behind me a little bit, and it's going through the lights with me. It's going through the lights with me. And finally, I look over, and lo and behold, it's a police officer in a cop car. And all he does is he looks over at me, he nods his head and we both continue to go through the red lights together because even he knew I wasn't able to stop in that area. And what I want to say about that is this, is a lot of this is dependent upon the community that you're in and the sin that is inherent in that place, what's accepted in that place. Sometimes it's white against black. Sometimes it gets black against white. Sometimes it's black against brown and Asian, whatever the case may be. But here's a deal. Look, what I would never say as a Christian is because I was almost killed because of the color of my skin in a particular area, that means that my other black brothers and sisters should be held responsible for those mm -hmm. people's sin. It's a wicked sin that I can't now say across the board, so you're all guilty for, it's what you're all like. That's the wickedness. That's the sin. Right. What if I were to do that? What if I were to say, in my experience growing up, I almost lost my life because of the color of my skin in a certain neighborhood? Would you condemn me if I said, so all my black brothers and sisters are all like that? What would you say? What would you say to me if I said something as wicked as that? You'd call me to repentance, rightly so. And in the same way, we need to interpret the current uh, cultural model <laughs> that tries to suggest that to us. Then we need to judge um, a whole people group on the basis of the activities of some in the people group. That's not how you deal with sin. And problems you deal with the heart issue and you call that sin exactly. out so i'll shut up now i wanted to tell that story well i'll say something real quick we probably should get to a break here but i think my wife and i were talking about this last night and yeah i mean to echo what you were saying i grew up 30 miles southeast of downtown chicago and five miles from downtown gary and for many years they would fight over murder murder capital of the u.s like so there's areas that you if you're white you just didn't go on those you know, it's the same thing. Like, I didn't, I don't go around thinking all black people are like that because I couldn't drive to downtown Gary without getting shot, you know? Like, mm -hmm. but that, so, anyways, um, but my, my, my wife and I were talking about this last night. And this is why I was, I was saying, like, the issue or the, the solution is the gospel. That's <laughs> yes, right. right. Yeah. It's not all this peripheral, like, laws and all this nonsense. It's not going to change anything. The only thing that's going to change people and make this right is the gospel. And so that sh that should be, and I know that's what we're trying to do, but that's where we should be coming from. Is and when you say that, can hearts. we just say, can we say yeah. this, Luke? Because I because that what you just said is like that's the answer. Yeah. But people hear that and it becomes just a slogan. The right. gospel's the answer. Okay, we'll go to a commercial break here. Okay, but why? It's good news of a kingdom. 
right? Mm -hmm. A king who's accomplished salvation and redemption for people from every tribe, people, tongue, and language, right? All those image bearers of God that are fallen in Adam and all dead and enemies of God, there is peace available through Jesus Christ and his redemption he's accomplished. And you know what's, what's beautiful is in Revelation, there's this scene of the worship that takes place before the throne of God. And you know what's happening before that throne? Men from every tribe, tongue, people, nation, and language are worshiping the Father and the Son. They're worshiping the one true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They are before that throne, all of them saved by the same blood, all of them image bearers of God. So when we say the gospel is the solution, because there's a whole worldview that says this is who people are, this is who God is, here's what's wrong, it's all the same, here's who Jesus is, this is what he did, here's what he accomplishes in the world, here's how he brings peace. The gospel mm. is the answer. Mm. That's the answer. Yeah. So we're going to take a quick break, come back, and I want to, I can't wait for this. This man is a blessing to us, and I, I hope you get to know Zach really well. His understanding of history and worldview, all that stuff, so very important. We're going to talk about two things coming back. Number one, I'm going to do a quick answer to false teacher Jory Micah um, and uh, her uh, s uh, trying to compare the temple cleansing of Jesus to the looting and rioting going on. Oh, today. she was one of the ones? She she did it. Um, uh, un this, this woman has – I'm going to show you this woman has absolutely <laughs> no – right to be teaching anybody anything oh. about the bible and uh shameful shameful stuff and uh and it's a blight on the name of of, of christ and christianity um but then we're going to talk about the boston tea party because people have tried to allege that what's happening tonight with the looting and the riots is like the boston tea party why are you so mad this happened before you guys praised this stuff before and so uh zach's going to help us a lot with that and so stay with us guys you don't want to miss it it's gonna be good stuff it'll help you a lot as you engage on these issues uh, praise God for his grace and for the Messiah who brings us together every tribe tongue people and nation language We're all together in Christ Amen. now praise Amen. God for that. We will be right back stay with us I want their faith to not just be something that stands but something around which culture can be built We want students who can um, think critically about arguments but also about the culture around them that can then speak clearly to it and that also have the ability to influence and shape because of the power of their message. Because that's really what the gospel does. The gospel throws down all the arguments against it. It speaks to the hearts of people, it influences, and it changes. The goal for New St. Andrews College, as it trains its students, is not to make people who will be able to go out and just get jobs. People who will just be bricks in the wall of our society. The goal for New St. Andrews College is to make students into men and women who will really impact culture.
Go to ApologiaStudios.com, get signed up, partner with us in all access. You get all of the radio programs, you get the TV show, you get the after show, including Apologia Academy, and you partner with us in ministry, bringing the gospel around the world. All right, everybody, welcome back. Welcome back to Apologia Radio. Thanks for hanging with us, guys. ApologiaStudios.com, A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A Studios.com is where you guys go to get more. We are here with Zach Lautenschlager and very, very excited about this next part of the discussion. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, sorry about all the technical issues today, everybody. I had stuff I want to show you, but we just aren't going to be able to do that, so I will read it to you. I wanted to address this quickly because it is something that's being propagated, and unfortunately, this is being propagated, this very, very... Uh, uh, suspicious and poor argumentations being propagated by progressive Christians on the left. And uh, it's being propagated by people, and it's, I think it's shameful, and uh, it, it shows uh, that uh, proof texting is dangerous, and uh, people need to uh, read their Bibles uh, in context and understand really the beauty of the Christian worldview. And um, we need to be able to see through these suspicious forms of argumentation uh, from false teachers like Jory Micah. Uh, Jory Micah, you may recognize from a video she did uh, fairly recently when John MacArthur, Pastor John MacArthur, said, uh, go home, Beth Moore. Jory Micah was um, overcome with emotion, and she did a video where she just filmed herself crying and saying, John MacArthur, look what you did to me. Um, and she wonders uh, why women uh, shouldn't have authority in the church. Um, well, there's an example, Jory. Uh, you can't get control of your emotions and think logically and critically. Another example of that, I'll just give you, I'll give you a, a quick move through her the last couple days on her Facebook. Um, uh, so six hours ago, in all caps with uh, three exclamation points, defund the police. Um, I was just and, talking about that. And then another one, I called the police once after I was physically assaulted by a man twice my size. By the end of it, I was arrested and he was not. I never ever call the police anymore, so who will I call if I'm in trouble? Not the pigs! Exclamation point. Hmm. Uh, interesting, Jory, you're not black. Hmm. So is the problem color or is the problem injustice? I would ask you to think about that. Um, so uh, this is the one I wanted to address here because I think it's important. Let me just move this down. Man, Max. Hmm. <laughs> while, you're, while you're looking, I was just I was talking to Zach about this earlier. I noticed that there's this push from the people that are, you know, rioting and all that stuff, saying we need to defund the police. These are the same people that also want very strict gun control. Mm. Um, so who's gonna who's gonna defend <laughs> you? <laughs> Which, uh, to be honest, I, mean, I think it's like God's destroying the public school system. He might be. Just destroying the public police force as well. We might have to get private police. Pri privatized which police. Which I'm, I'm okay yeah. with, yeah. but it's just funny coming from these people because it's like, you don't want anybody to have guns and you don't want the police now, so now what? Well, also, Jory says, uh, I've never seen so many white people concerned over black people's businesses before. Um, 
Jory, I don't know what crowd you're running in, but um, we talk a lot about private property and things like that and uh, equality amongst uh, image bearers of God. And so we showed actually a lot of concern. It's interesting because Jory Micah seems to be adopting sort of a leftist, progressive, socialist uh, ideology. Um, if you love, pri- if, if you're concerned with private property, Jory, uh, you should abandon your neo-Marxist and socialist worldview uh, because the destruction of private property is inherent in the th- kind of things that you're propagating. The uh, she's a big Democrat now, big Democrat, uh, and uh, Democratic Party is not big on private property. Ultimately, it's moving a certain direction. And if you know history at all, which I doubt you do, um, just based on what I see of you and know about you, um, y- you'll know that uh, those policies end up somewhere, and uh, it's a it's a word that starts with. C and ends with an N. Um, and uh, so, okay, here we go. All right. Um, so let's see here. Uh, let's see. Let me move down here. Oh, man, Max. There it is. Okay. So she has a quote. It's a picture of, of, of Jesus um, at the temple, you know, obviously cleansing the temple. You've got these like Pharisee looking dudes over there. And it says, quote, injustice is no reason to destroy property. It's a quote. Uh, and then she says, Jesus, showing Jesus destroying property in the temple. Hmm. That's a suspicious argument there, Jory. It's a very suspicious argument, and it shows that uh, you clearly need to read your Bible and understand what Jesus is doing. Um, Jesus is the high priest. Um, Jesus was anointed uh, by John the Baptist. John's, John the Baptist's dad was a priest. And um, when you think about the biblical worldview and what God has actually laid down long before Jesus ever came to cleanse the temple, it, you, it, would, do, it would do you well to start thinking and asking deep questions like, why are there two cleansings of the temple in the New Testament? Why do we have one at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in John? And why do we have one in the synoptics near the end of Jesus' ministry? People before have actually suggested there's a contradiction here. We have uh, John and the other uh, uh, Gospels can't seem to get it right. We've got one at the beginning of the ministry and one near the end. Uh, so apparently uh, there's contradiction in the story. No, if you know the law of God, Leviticus 14, you know what the priest was supposed to do. There's this dress rehearsal going on where the priest would have to go to a house house that was diseased and there was a first looking at the house and a cleansing of the house of disease and then the priest would have to come back again and examine the house and if there was disease found uh, then that house was ultimately destroyed taken apart brick from brick and so isn't it interesting that at the beginning of Jesus ministry Jesus the high priest goes to the temple the house and he does a cleansing and then near the end of his ministry he comes back and he finds it diseased again and he cleanses it again and isn't interesting that same context jesus actually says their house is left to them desolate and he says that there wouldn't be left one stone standing upon another there's the cleansing of the temple there's jesus actually fulfilling the role of the priest that was pictured or portrayed in the old testament and they did this rehearsal constantly they didn't even realize that this was pointing to jesus the high priest who was going to cleanse the temple but also very important when you try to compare jesus the sinless holy son of god our messiah Two people who are murdering people, looting, stealing from other people, destroying other people's property. And I'll remind you, Jory, that we have um, people of every color destroying property. But isn't it interesting? We have black businesses who are now suffering, uh, black owners uh, of businesses, families that are suffering because their property has been destroyed. What did they have to do with George Floyd's murder? Why are they being oppressed and destroyed because of that? When you try to compare Jesus to wickedness, you demonstrate yourself to be deadly, spiritually deadly, Jory, and ignorant. Ignorant of the Bible, ignorant of what Jesus was doing in terms of fulfilling the role of the priest, but I'll just point you to a passage that should show you once and for all that you uh, should essentially um, not be opening your Bible in front of people and exercising any kind of teaching authority over anybody, Jory. And here is what I want to point you to is uh, Malachi it's a uh, last book in your Old Testament. It's really short. I encourage you to take a look at it because it's important. In Malachi chapter 3, there's a, prop, uh, there's a prophecy of this Messiah who's coming. Here's what it says. Malachi 3, 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. That's John the Baptist. Jesus said that. And the Lord whom you seek, the Lord whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. Mm-hmm. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. That's a prophecy of John the Baptist. And then Jesus, the Lord whom you seek, will come to his temple. By the way, isn't that 
awesome the Old Testament, the Lord whom you seek will come to his temple after the messenger, uh, John the Baptist. Now, whose temple is this, Jory? <laughs> whose temple is it? Whose property is it? So here you have Jesus, according to the scriptures, coming to his temple. It's his property. It belongs to him. And he's got foreign invaders coming in there, bringing in sin and disease, and he's cleansing his house. Comparing looters and rioters who are destroying other people's property to Jesus cleansing his temple is straight wicked, Jory. And you've been exposed for it. There is no way out of this. All this progressive, socialist, leftist Christianity, all of your leaning towards communism isn't going to cover for the extraordinarily bad argumentation that you provide there. You are part of the problem, Jory, and you need to repent. I'm, I'm really confused by her post. Is she saying that Jesus was sinful? Well, I mean, if you if you want to if you want to compare <laughs> what's what... happening today with the murder of people and the destruction of other people's private property, and say Jesus also did that, so, yeah. So the the sinless Messiah did sinful things. No, it's almost like she's saying, "Well, Jesus said that you know that destroying someone's property is unjust, but he did it." You know, <clears throat> and so it's like, so are you saying that he said one thing but did another, so that would be sin? It's a problem. It's, it's That's a real problem. Really confused what she's <laughs> I, trying to I, I, there. I, I, I've, I've come to not expect a lot of uh, rationality or consistent thinking from Jory Micah, and um, um, I, you know, I'd love her to repent and 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 uh, and and come to Jesus in a way that is uh, glorifying to God. But as long as you have a false teacher like Jory Micah abusing the Word of God and other people, it's the duty of the Christian Church and especially ministers of the gospel to call someone like her out. She is. Um, uh, not representative of Christ and a consistent Christian position. Okay, so Luke, you wanted to bring Zach on specifically to talk about the other arguments being we, made. Yeah, Go we ahead. were we were at dinner last week with with John Barrows, and Zach messaged me and said, "Hey, did you see that people are comparing the ride to the Boston Tea Party?" And I thought he was joking. I was like, "No," and he's like, "No, I'm serious." And I was like, "Okay, we need to talk about this." So I'm just going to bring you right in. You you just lay it out and. I sure. think it's just hilariously stupid, but go ahead. Well, you see it happening there. You see people saying, well, it's like the Stamp Act riots. Um, it's, it, and the general argument is, well, clearly America was established through violence, and so that's the only way anybody gets anything done. Um, and Medium is, you know, is, is going on about, well, this is, you know, it might be slightly messy, but it's an acceptable uh, vehicle for cl- changing a clearly bad situation, mm. which is the classic cultural Marxist sure. argument. Right that the only way to get things done is the raised fist and that we have to have warfare yeah. um, and, and do injustice to fix injustice. Yeah. That's the basic argument. Yeah. Um, what is so horrific about it, and, and we tend to think about cultural Marxism as a modern um, phenomenon. Mm-hmm. No, this was, this was exactly the same discussion that was happening all over the world when uh, the colonies decided, okay, k- the king has kicked us out. What are we going to do? We, we have the rights of Englishmen, but they're not giving them to us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Marx himself looked back at the French Revolution and revered it. And mm-hmm. you, have, you understand that this was going on. The French Revolution, we think about, well, that was later, right? That was Napoleon. That's 20 years after the Revolution. No, it, it, it's going on in France right now. These problems are problems in France, and you have the same um, people advocating for satanic rebellion in the same way. And you have people doing that in the United States, and that's the fascinating thing. What would become the U.S.? So, you know, in short, if we want to talk about the Tea Party, we have to get down to asking, well, whose private property was it, and um, how was it destroyed, and to what end, and what's going on with this? Because that's the basic argument. People will come up, you know, CNN comes, well, it was just like the Tea Party, and everyone's like, well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was property, and it got destroyed. Kind of like, well, see, it was Jesus. It was property and got destroyed. Jesus well, and, and, right, and the Englishman. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, okay, so let's go back and say, first of all, what, what happened with this? Well, you have a 10-year period in which a new king comes to the throne. It's George III, and um, you have a parliament which is deeply in debt, partially because of the war, ongoing war with France, uh, part of which was fought in the colonies. So Europe calls it Seven Years' War. We call it the French and Indian War. Okay. Um, and so the the impetus was 
in England, which is starting to come apart a little bit at the seams. The empire is has trouble. They're in financial trouble. They're over. They're, you know, the, the sun never sets on the British Empire at this point. This is when that first started to happen. Is in the seven, mid 1700s, and they ha- don't have enough money, and so they say, "Well, we need to tax the colonies. Mm. We, we need to make them pay for the war because this was for their defense." Well, us colonists said, well, hang on. You guys brought your war over here. Right. We faithfully went and fought it with you because we're subjects of the king. He called on our service and we went. And now you're saying we have to pay for it? Okay, well, we can talk about that if you're going to tax us legally, which means you come to our colonial parliaments and say, hey, we need tax. And the parliaments pass a tax and then the king signs off on it and then we pay it. And they did it all the time. In fact, most people don't know that Sam Adams was a tax collector. Ah. He was the Boston City tax collector. That's what he did. That's what he got paid to do. And no one made that turncoat. Right, and no one hated him for it. (laughs) Well, now he wasn't collecting. They loved his beer, that's (laughs) why. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he loved beer. Um, So when that happened, you had, they passed the Stamp Act. And the Stamp Act wasn't about stamps that we think of. It was about, it was a business tax. It was a transactional tax. You had to pay a tax on paper. How do you get anything done? It's like paying a tax on, on neutrons today. It's like paying a tax on electric flow to your computer. You can't, you couldn't do anything. You couldn't buy anything. You couldn't sell anything. You couldn't do anything without paying the tax on paper. Hmm. And that's what the Stamp Act was. You had to get the stamps to say, I paid the tax in order to transact, to do business. Perfect mercantile tax, right? Oh, that's powerful. So, you have the loyal nine, and you know I'm trying to pack this down so you understand the whole the whole sweep of things. But this is proto Sons of Liberty. These guys, a couple of them became the Sons of Liberty, and Sam Adams knew most of them. One of them was his cousin. The only way we know who the loyal nine were was after they kind of got what they wanted and disbanded, or were close to disbanding. They invited John Adams, mm. the other Adams, yeah. to come and talk, and he wrote down who he, because he had a journal. He wrote down in his journal who he went to meet with. Okay, and so we know it was these nine guys. Okay, I so love I love this. They yeah, keep going, Zach. They stand up and say, "Okay, we know what's really going on here. Parliament wants to rule the colonies." You have to understand that the entire colonial structure is you got a bunch of oppressed Protestants a century and a half before mm-hmm. who say, "We do not, will not submit to the Church of England and to a chur- state church. We will not accept the Book of Worship. We will worship God according to conscience." And so, the real covenanters. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yes, we can talk about the the Scottish governors, and they were awesome. Yeah. But the the English covenanters, they left and God opened the door, and they went to a, the, and be, and G- James the first was like, "Get these people out of here. <laughs> what do we have to <laughs> do want them around. to get rid of these? Oh, we could send them to a wilderness where they'd be eaten by Indians." Great, get and that was there. he literally said that. I mean, that was that was what Europe thought that they were just going to go get devoured by the wilderness and whatever wow. savages lived out there. Get rid of those Presbyterians to talk about racism. Mm-hmm. You know, that's James. Mm-hmm. So they get sent out, and what do they do? Well, the, the way they left, they said, "Well, hang on, we want a charter that says we get to govern ourselves. We'll be submissive to the king." The king's like, "Whatever, here, go." And so every colony that got started had a charter that said, "We get our own parliament, which is subject to the king, mm-hmm. just like England has a parliament." we get a parliament. And those were the state assemblies, which became the state legislatures. That is the very concept, the whole ah. concept of federal government. That's where that comes from. Okay? Mm. Um, I mean, that's where it has its impetus. I mean, we can argue it comes from scripture, but, and I would agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm with you. Okay, so now it's 1765, and the loyal nine say, you know what, they don't want a tax. If they want a tax, they could come, and we would charge a tax, and we'd pay it, and it's no problem. All the patriots, some of them are tax collectors. It's not a big deal. They want control. Because once you acknowledge pay a tax, if you got a bill from the state of New Mexico, a tax bill, and you're a resident of the state of Arizona, would you pay it? Or would you say, there's a mistake, there's something wrong, I'm yeah. not paying, I, I don't, and live there. I, I, would light it on, I would do a Facebook Live video and light <laughs> it, on it on fire. fire. Yeah. I would literally just never drive through New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> I'd drive around if I had to. I have <laughs> a fight like that going on with Wyoming right now. But... <laughs> So no, this is what this like. What's that? What's that from that one? That one show? I, I fart in your general direction. Oh, <laughs> like uh, something Monty like Python. Monty Python. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh no! So, so now we can now we can quote Monty Python. <laughs> yes, <laughs> totally. Yes, yeah. There's so many. <laughs> Being oppressed by the system. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now you have and and everybody's like, no, they just want to pay the tax. Just pay the tax. And the loyal nine says, no, absolutely not. So what can we do? Well, we have to have grassroots support. It's nine dudes. Mm-hmm. They're afraid to even publish their names because they know what's going to happen. The king's uh, representatives will just round them up. So you have this whole period in which Benjamin Franklin is actually in England and he's making passion pleas and they're making this plea to the king that please rein in the parliament. The parliament is out of line. Oh, king, we serve you. And we refuse to acknowledge that this is you, this is your advisors, this is the parliament, they're trying to hurt us, please stop. And, in, and that's going on in 
Boston, you have these nine guys who are like, they're going to charge the tax. What are we going to do? Well, they round it up. And unfortunately, this is where it gets interesting. You have the North End mob and the South End mob. And these are the the poorest people, and they compete every year, and they're a mob because they compete every year for who will burn the Pope in effigy on Pope's Day, which is the 5th of November. Mm. Remember, remember the 5th of November. This is when Guy Fox. We call it Guy Fox Day now. The Catholics tried to blow up Parliament. Mm. It was a Catholic plot to end Protestant reign in England and, and blow up the Parliament. Um, and so, of course, that wasn't very popular in England, in, in the United States, or <laughs> with the colonies at this point. And so... The Loyal Nine recruited a dude named Ebenezer McIntosh, who runs the South End mob. And this guy is rough. And these guys, these are not savory characters. They go out and they fight one another with, with sticks and clubs and throw bricks at each other. And people get hurt every year. Somebody dies every few years. And it's this big release. And everybody's like, okay, well, it lets the, you know, lets the, <laughs> the street people fight it out and get out of the system once a year. And whoever wins the mob fight gets to burn the Pope in effigy. <laughs> and it's kind of this whole this It's like Gangs of New York. It's like Gangs of New York. Yeah. It absolutely is 100 and <laughs> oh years before. So, mm-hmm. okay. Well, guess what? They can demonstrate. They do show up. They're willing to, to agitate. And so the Loyal Nine make the mistake of, of tr- pressuring Macintosh into helping them oppose the tax. Now, a lot of the people don't want to pay the tax anyway because they don't like tax, right? But you have a huge portion of the... Then that's the... You know, that's this little troublemaking chunk. And so they maybe didn't need to be talked into too bad. Macintosh didn't want to help them. And so Sam Adams went over to the Loyal Nine. One of his cousins said, he owes a bunch of tax. And then <laughs> suddenly... He, the tax gets paid and Macintosh is on their side. I don't know exactly what happened, but it's pretty <laughs> clear the Loyal Nine paid his taxes. And Mac and and Adams said, if you don't join, if you don't accept them paying your tax, I'm going to arrest you. Wow! And so they pressured Macintosh into leading the mob, and that ha- and so this is 1765, and you have got this period of 65 to 66 when there were the Stamp Act riots, and they actually were real riots where some property began to be damaged at one point, and that's where the tarring and feathering comes from. If you watch the John huh. Adams miniseries. Which was phenomenal. It is a great show, yeah. but I couldn't watch it because oh, in, the it first se- in the first show, they've got him tarring and feathering somebody. <laughs> that is, it just, I, I very rarely will yell at the TV. I don't get into it. <laughs> but I just was unhinged. I turned it off, and I, I haven't watched it again oh, because wow. that is, it is evil. Adams was appalled by that. John was. Sam was. Okay. And the Loyal Nine were appalled that they are hurting people. You understand tarring feathering. I mean, yeah. being stripped naked, having oil or tar put on, it's hot enough to blister your skin. Right. Covered, and then you're carried out and beaten while you're being... I mean, people died being tarred yeah. and feathered. Oh, yeah. Um, it, so, it's this brutal attack. Stuff was being broken, and eventually, as things went up, now they're trying. They're trying to rein him in. Stop doing that, but oppose. You know, do the right thing. And eventually, they burn down the lieutenant governor's mansion. The touch, governor, lieutenant governor Hutchinson's mansion. They threaten the life of the tax, the the parliamentary tax collector. They run him out of town. So eventually, the Stamp Act is repealed a year later. Mm. But through this whole fight, they fire Macintosh because he's out of control. He's hurting people. He's damaging private property. And the whole point was, how could we possibly sit here and say that we have a charter and we are pursuing justice when they're breaking stuff, hurting private property, and threatening people's lives and liberty? They're threatening my, their persons. Yeah. That, and that's when they recruited Paul Vere to run the, to run the street demonstrations. Mm. It was kind of interesting because you have this competition, North End, South End. Macintosh runs the South End. Paul Revere is North End. And he's, he's town-born. You know, he's a hardcore Bostonite. And everybody recognizes him. But he knows everybody. And so they learned through that, you can't just jump in bed with whoever comes along. That's the problem with Antifa. They are being welcomed in in some cases, and you can look at it and see it. And you can look at, look at a lot of people that are looking at that going now, holy cow, they're hurting the whole cause. Get out of town. There's all these videos of these people yelling at them, black people saying, against these little commie. <laughs> say it. Say it. <laughs> preach little it. Little commie, punk ass. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, but yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that on air. Well, but that is, uh, that is what, they're, that's what they're being in, called. In the, in the modern vernacular. Yeah. Modern yeah. punk. Yeah. Beep. Yeah. Yes. Breaking concrete with hammers. You saw that one guy. Right. I'm like, what yes. are you even doing? Anyways. Right. So... That's where this whole thing comes from, okay? So you have Paul Revere, who then starts running the street, street demonstrations. What happens when they, and, and eventually, they make so much noise through all of this. It does help change things, but it puts them on this dangerous footing where they're in danger of losing everything because you can't have enough support. You can't win if the very thing you're trying to, cl- to fix, which is just injustice, 
is being your whole fight is being pushed by with injustice. Injustice. Exactly. So hey, that sounds that sounds, sounds familiar. familiar, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So were the Stamp Act were there Stamp Act riots? Yes. Yes, there were. It actually did happen. There was rioting, and everyone was appalled. And they said, "Stop it!" And they fired the guy who was doing it. And they brought in Paul Revere. And that's where that whole thing comes from. Yeah. Okay. So a year later, the Stamp Act is repealed, and they pass the Declaratory Act, which so just comes out and says, "Okay, fine. We're not going to charge you a tax. You just are enslaved to us." Parliament claims authority huh. directly, rather than doing indirectly. The law and line was right. They said they're trying to take power over us. No, we're not trying to do that. A year later, they repeal it and say, "Yeah, that's what we were trying to do." Yeah, we were doing it. <laughs> so the next nine years, you have this whole fight of the Cl- Declaratory Act and then the T tax, etc. Okay, so now fast forward to you know you have the whole problems, and one of the fruits of the whole Stamp Act issue was in 1770. You eventually have because of the riots, what happened? The king sent troops. And that's where we get the whole Fourth Amendment, where you can't have troops quartered in your house. That was happening. He sent soldiers to live in the houses and said, you are not going to get away with this because I'm going to put troops in your bedroom so you can't talk to, to anybody about anything. Mm. Um, and so eventually, so in 1770, wow. you have the Boston Massacre, right? And that was where the troops fired on an unarmed yeah. mo- mob. Now, why did they fire? Probably because they were afraid. They heard the stories of what happened to Macintosh. Now, at this point... There was nobody out there. There was one guy who was drunk and was yelling and doing stuff, and he was one of those who was killed. A 12-year-old boy was killed. Uh. Um, and you had, But you had this horrible injustice of armed troops firing point-blank, deadly we- I mean, it was, and the officers commanded them to fire. It was the whole nine yards. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, now, we can talk about that. I'll try to get distracted because there's so much you could talk about. But no, this is good. Okay, so you have the Boston Massacre. Now what? Well, that ends in defeat for the British. For th- with the crown, they're all British, but it ends in defeat for the crown because the colonists understand that by this time you've got Dr. Joseph Warren and Sam Adams have the Loyal Nine kind of disbanded once the Stamp Act was repealed in 1766. They said, okay, that's great, we won, you know, let's, and by that time Sam Adams had possessed that whole structure. He was the, he was the original community organizer um, and understood we need a less formal, larger association and became the sons of liberty it wasn't written down anywhere are you a son of liberty yes okay you've joined the sons of liberty that was what it was and so two of the members of the loyal nine were known sons of liberty after that uh, the, the guy who published the boston gazette he's the, the you know the pamphleteer mm. uh, the entire first amendment that's part of a big part of where that comes from being able to speak wow. s- hand stuff out and speak t- to the public so um so that whole thing grows and becomes um this very focused fight because after 1770 we got our news to the British people. We got our um, s- telling of what happened. What was the Boston Massacre? Was it, you know, was it an uprising that was lawfully put down by the king's troops? Like, you know, were they bringing down the governor's mansion? Or was this an unarmed mob yelling at them, go home, stop oppressing us, and they shoot in their faces? Okay, which one is it? Mm-hmm. Well, the, the Americans put their news on a faster ship than the British could because we have Salem, and Salem was known for the fastest clipper ships in the world, mm-hmm. and we got there a week before they did. Wow. And by the time the by the time Governor Gage's news got there, everyone in, in, in the streets of London had read our pamphlet and was saying, y- the crown is wrong. Parliament is wrong. Wow. They're oppressing. That's They're like us. They're oppressing those poor people across the water. Those are our... That, that's our family. That's our people. And so now... It's a powder keg, and in General Gage, who is the military governor by that point, um, is in a horrible position, and he knows it. And so, eventually, they come up with this plan to force the colonies to acknowledge the, the rule of Parliament. That obviously they already ru- acknowledge the rule of the Crown, but they want the colony of Massachusetts, which you understand is basically that's e- England looks at the colonies and says, "Well, there's Massachusetts and Virginia." And that's all there is. Huh. That's their whole perspective. So they're basically getting half of the colonies at this point. If they get Massachusetts, that's their thinking. We're going to force them to pay a tax, whether they like it or not. We're going to send this tea over there, and we're going to tax the tea. And they all drink tea. Mm-hmm. So eventually they'll they're cave They're English. In. They're English. Mm-hmm. They're going to drink the tea. Um, and so why is it that Americans still drink coffee? That's <laughs> <laughs> true. There was a cultural thing. Now, I like well, tea better. It's better for my coffee bothers me. Yeah. So... I'll admit I drink tea. Yeah. Sam Adams would be appalled. Yeah. But so that's the that was the whole plot. Let's tax the tea. Now this is private property that's owned by these semi private, semi public. It depends on you know, the tea was owned by a couple different people. Was it the East Indian Tea Company, which is basically a you know, it's a governmental body, it has its own army. Hmm. Or was what? it Oh yeah. Or was it private you know, John Hancock trafficked in tea. 
Yeah. So, you know, which was, it was a combination, but it was at that point private property that they put the tax on and they sent it over and the ships came into the harbor in 1773. And what happened? Well, Adams, Revere, and Warren saw that come in and then they said, well, we can't allow this. So they called up, you know, they monstered their friends, called on their friends, and several Sons of Liberty just showed up and, and stood there with, with their guns and marched up and down from the ships and said, we will not allow you to unload that tea. We're not going to hurt anything. We're not going to do anything. But if you want to unload that tea, you're going to have to shoot us. Because you know and we know that if you unload that tea, you are going to be forcing us to acknowledge the authority of Parliament huh. to legislate for us. And what were they worried about? Well, that year, they pat they made uh, the Church of England the official state church in Canada, which is just the colony next door. That's not a different country. It's the same country. It's a different colony. Yeah, right. And so that was the, I mean, that's the, the chief problem right there. Uh, but you have all the other problems of being ruled by a body that lives 2,000, what, 4,000 miles away across an ocean that takes a month to get across. Mm. Yeah. So how do, how, are, how do they make laws for you? Right. And then you have the fact that this is a mercantile, this is an evil mercantile empire system. Okay? That's what it is. I love England. I, I, that heritage is there. I love a lot about it. Uh, but their government has been perfidious for a long time. Perfidious Albion is a thing. I mean, you Google it. <laughs> Albion is the is the word for England, and so it's nasty, and they do not want to be ruled by that. Um, and so they post the soldiers. Now, then, what happens? Well, the crown says, "Oh, I'll tell you what. Guess what? What we're going to do is set a date, and on that date, whether the tea is sold or not, because this is a this is a transactional tax. Again, you pay the tax when you buy a pound of tea. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to do it that way. We're going to charge the tax from the public treasury on X day." Ah. Uh. I think it was the 15th of December, because I'm pretty sure the Boston Tea Party, I'm going to get in trouble, but I think it was the 16th, if I'm recalling correctly. I can look it up here. Yeah, December 16th. So it was December 15 that the tax would be deducted from the public treasury. Wow. And therefore, we could say they paid the tax, and therefore, they we can subjugate them. They now have, have voluntarily placed themselves under the, the, par the authority of Parliament. Because you're paying tax. Because you pay tax. And so, at that point, that's when Revere and Adams, and by the way, my son's name are Warren, Charles Lautenschlager, and Revere, Prescott Revere Lautenschlager. Now, that's why they're... We can see what side you're on. <laughs> we see what side you're on. <laughs> so, but they sit there and, okay, what, what are we going to do? This is, and they called a meeting of the lead um, 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 Liber Sons of Liberty, and the only conclusion at this point, once the state says... We're going to force you to pay tax on whether or not you buy the property. You can't argue that that's private property anymore. The state has taken control of that property and says, oh, and the other thing you have to recognize, at that point, the last effort was, okay, let's pay the ship's captains, the owners, you know, the men who represent, who, the men who own the tea, yeah. to leave. Hmm. We didn't buy the tea. Right. We paid you to leave. Right. But now you're not liable because they still, they, who, whose money was in the tea? The, the they're, owners. They're still getting paid. Right. We'll pay now, you. But now no tea is transacted. No tea will be transacted. Yeah. So there's this, whole, there's this whole dance. What happens? Oh, it's some sweet so stuff. The British send the man of war into the mouth of Boston Harbor and say, if you try to leave, we'll sink you. Ah, what? Yes. Oh, you okay. dirty so scoundrels. Is it, is it private property now? <laughs> no, anymore. the British Crown just took it. They just yeah, said they you can't stole, sell it. They and if you try to leave, we will kill you. Whoa. That was dirty. Wow. <laughs> and so now yeah. it's December 15th. What are you going to do? Yeah. Well, they had one final plea. And they were in, they were all gathered in, um, in the um, Old South Meeting House. It was a church. And everyone came and they officially and ceremoniously, because this is the whole thing, right? This, this whole dance where everybody knows what's going on. Yeah. They sent, officially and ceremoniously sent the messenger over to Governor Gage's, to Gage and Hutchins' house and said, uh, will you please, that's our last appeal, you are the king's representative. And that's how they saw it. The governor was the king sitting there right when they went to talk to the governor you were talking to the king because right. it's the king's representative. Mm -hmm. representative and when the king's troops are here you are looking at the king mm -hmm. mm. and they acknowledged that and they said and it was that was if they wanted to riot they would have it would have continued from 1765 mm -hmm. when it first started they again and again and again and again to the to, uh, just to, to enough to make a person nauseous it was just went on forever and ever and ever please oh king please Please remedy this problem. We are your loyal subjects. One last try to the governor. Please, please allow the ships to leave. The night before you charge the tax. Mm. At the end of this day, it's over. So, um, and what happened? Well, and that was the 16th. I said 15th earlier. It was the 16th. The tax got charged on the 17th. 
Um, the governor sends his messenger back. No, I will not. Sam Adams stands up and says, this meeting can do no more to save the country. That's an exact quote. You can watch the old Disney movie of, of Johnny Tremaine. He says it exactly. So cool. And what happens? They walk out of there and give the signal, it's time to go. And a bunch of dudes who are dressed as Indians, you don't understand why, um, they were dressed as Indians partially so they couldn't be recognized and, and picked out individually. Mm. Um, you have to understand, though, that Revere probably didn't wear a costume because everybody knew who he was. Mm. And he exposed himself as the leader um, and he would have been the person who had been, you know, they would have went and got him if they were going to get somebody. Yeah. Everybody else disguised themselves. Why Indians? Why not, you know, wear a, you know, whatever. There were a million different ways. It was a political symbol. Um, if you look at all of the political um, cartoons of the day, the Eng- England is always John Bull. And it's still a thing today. That's where the whole idea of the bulldog comes with a big barrel-chested guy, and that's England. And America is always a Native American. Hmm. Now, we can say that's racist, and we can talk about that, whatever. Um, but that was the accepted political symbol for an American colonist. So ah. what were they going to dress up? They were going to dress like American. You know, what's what's the Native political American. symbol? It's we're like dress the up elephant and the donkey. Correct. Kind of it was thing. just yeah. like dressing yeah. up like an elephant. Yeah. Ah. That was what they were doing. And ah. so they, at least, it's pretty obvious. I don't know if anybody ever wrote it down, but you look at that and go, oh, it's a political cartoon, except they're walking down the street. <laughs> yes. And so they walk down to the ship. They stand in front of the ship. They call the owners. I think there were three ships, if I'm not mistaken. They call the ship's captains out, and they say, sir, may we have your keys? And the captains at this point, I mean, they know what it's all about. Most of them are like, yeah, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> One of them was like, oh, please, do I have to? And then, yes, you have to. I mean, come on, you have to. And, okay, gave them the keys. They went, they were more orderly on ship. They unlocked the tea cabinets. You know, those are the, the big things on the, on the floor that open up. Yeah. They got the chests of tea out. Um, most of them chests they had lo- locks for, they unlocked them. There was one chest they didn't have a key for. And if they left one packet of tea, guess what was going to happen? They were going to get charged tax on that one packet of one pound of tea. So they broke the lock off that chest. They took all the tea, they threw it in the harbor, and they said, let's make Boston Harbor one giant teapot tonight. That was the thing. They, they swept all of the tea. And if you look at tea, you know, it not doesn't come in little envelopes like we make tea right, now. Right. You know, it's a scoop, so it's black, and it gets all over everything. Yeah. They sweep off the decks. They clean off everything. They put the, lo- the chests back together. They put them all back down in the hold. They give the captain, they leave orderly and go down to the Liberty, Liberty Tree and hold a celebration that we outfoxed the British crown at this point. And they would never say, they would say they outfoxed Parliament. They were still pleading with the king. It'd be another three years before, or two years before, it became came to open blows with, with the crown. Um, now that night, um, I believe it was that night or the next morning, the governor said, I believe they have done it according to the law. Mm. They did everything according to the common law. And you have to understand the common law wasn't this big book, right? It's right. all the precedent and all the memories, mm-hmm. and a lot of it is, some of it is oral, although not much. It's written down, but you have to know, oh, that's written in this little corner over here, in this case law. Um, and he, as the representative of the Crown, said, well, I think they did it. And he was like, darn it, what, what can we do? The next morning, Paul Revere shows up at the ship with a brand new lock. He walks over to the captain and says, yeah. I'm sorry, sir, we destroyed one of your locks last night. It was the only thing that got hurt. Here's a new one. Mm-hmm. and gave them the new lock and went home. Okay. Now, what were they doing? Why are they doing that? Well, they said the same thing. You can't, you can't destroy property, and you can't threaten anyone's liberty, and you can't threaten their person or their life if the whole point is to fight injustice. I mean, wh- what is that going to... So that is... And it's a, it's a long story, but the short answer is, that wasn't private property. What are you talking about? Yeah. And who got hurt? Where, yeah. Where's the people getting beat with two-by-fours? Yeah. Where's the guy getting shot in the back of his head? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> where's the windows being replaced? Yeah. <laughs> the broken windows. Yes. So, if these guys wanted to be Boston, there's really no way to get out, rectify it at this point. But they, what, if they wanted to try to emulate it, they would go back and they would fix all the property and pay for all the damage. Or yeah, or they would make sure it didn't. The, p- the point is with these riots. The point is for those who are making them hotspots, right? There are lots of people who are protesting peaceably. Yes. 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 But sir. then you've got the you do what many of them are doing. Get out of here. What are you doing here? Right. Is it going to be messy? Is there a chance for bad people to come in and abuse and misuse in a, a peacefully planned event? Sure. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, there is. Um, so yes, would they clean it up? Yes. But then would they also learn from this and say, we're not doing that again? Mm-hmm. It, it, you could argue that, it, okay, it did happen in America. There was a riot. They burned the governor's house down, the lieutenant governor's mansion down. Mm-hmm. They threatened the life of the tax collector. They made him leave town by threatening to kill him. Okay? 
Was that a problem? Yes. And they remedied that situation and said, never again. Mm -hmm. Never, ever again. And anyone who tries to do that, they, people tried to tar and feather again, and they would go and physically make them stop. They would restrain them. Mm -hmm. Say, you can't threaten somebody's person that way. Mm -hmm. So that's what political protests, absolutely. And I love the examples of the police who showed up, took off their riot gear, prayed with the protesters, and then marched with them. It says, as long as you guys are here for, to be peaceful... We're not even. We're not even going to go there. Mm. And a bu the, in those cases, you saw the protesters. The the little white commie punks weren't there, mm -hmm. and or, or got scared off, got ran off, mm -hmm. and it was a peaceful protest that mm -hmm. made the point. Now, eventually, did it come to blows? And everyone's like, "Yeah, but it was war." Eventually, well, yeah, when the king's troop f fired on them, right? And there was an armed body there saying, "You can't come into our town and steal our stuff and take away and possibly burn our town down. We won't let you." Mm -hmm. And they got fired on. Okay, mm -hmm. yes, then it was war. It's war, baby. Yeah, justified. Wow. Man. Woo! Now you know why we love I Zach. Got, I could sit and listen to you tell stories all day. <laughs> I know. Which did, awesome we stuff. might as well use this as a as an advertisement for all access. So Zach's actually go, go ahead. next. He's about to teach number two, right? Or yes. three. Two of uh, American history um, for our all access. So we're excited that so yeah so speaking of that all access guys you can get uh you can get it there do it apologia studios.com a-p-o-l-o-g-i-a studios.com sign up for all access partner with us in ministry everything we do we do with you because of you yep. and so we're grateful for you um we are headed to uh salt lake city next week to continue filming for our documentary on mormonism we hope that god uses this documentary to bring christians out in mass to start evangelizing their mormon neighbors i believe that in many ways uh mormonism is on its last legs in, oh, yeah. in a sense theologically speaking uh, it's, it's going through a lot of transformation right now and i think we are in a prime prime amazing opportunity and moment to be an effective witness and light to the darkness of Mormonism and to bring the truth of the gospel to that community. So we're f we're working on this documentary. Uh, Sandra Tanner's in it. Uh, Bill McKeever, Dr. White, myself, us, all of us. We're filming for um, uh, next week. A couple things for the film, but also some testimonies of people who have come out of Mormonism to Christ. So pray for that. Uh, we're also doing some work for EAN all along the way. Pray for our trip, pray for the movie, pray for the film, and pray that God uses it. Mm -hmm. uh, pray for this man right here mm -hmm. and uh, all that he's doing with us behind the scenes uh, to bring justice uh, to our own particular state and also to yours in the area of uh, the abolition of abortion, the criminalization of abortion, the true pro-life movement. Amen. Christians uh, that are consistently pro-life and working for the criminalization of abortion. We're pro-life, gospel-centered. We're the real pro-life. Uh, so we're working on all that right now, guys, um, and uh, be in prayer for that. EndAbortionNow.com is where you all go to get free training, free resources for your church to go out and save lives alongside us. Uh, that's Luke the Bear. Peace out. That's Zach. I am Jeff the Common Ninja. We'll catch you next time right here on Apologia Radio.